needs to hear your voice. Right. That speaker is going over your head, so you'll have to hear it off the monitor, sir. Are we on? Uh... We're on still. Okay, so you can move it on to the uh, beginning of the praise then. Yeah, when you're ready. I think we yeah, have to put us on.
you want to stand for this one, it is kind of a show. So, really sitting is almost a crime. <laughs> Thank you. 
acknowledge and respect the land and territories of the Lekwungen, Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples where we gather to worship. The love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so we affirm together that the love of God is always with us. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the light of Son, so guide us by your light that we may know in our lives the beauty and truth and wisdom of your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Just before we light the children's candle, does somebody want to make sure that we got the wise ones into the. Are they still waiting? Well, quick, while we sing, stick them in the manger. They didn't make their journey yet. So let's sing together. Come and see the light. It is the light of Jesus. The 
first reading comes from Jeremiah 31, verses 7 to 14. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts to the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd uh, a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and has redeemed him from the hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry, and I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you're able, we stand to sing together before the Gospel reading with three kings.
The Lord is with you. And also with you. According to John, chapter 1, verse 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Lord, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. The Gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. downsides uh, of being a preacher is that sometimes you find yourself carrying around in your little brain a piece of scripture, a verse, or a, a part of a passage that just absolutely gets lodged in your mind and it nags away at you and pesters you and bothers you for days and days or sometimes weeks and weeks. So this year, 
my Christmas and New Year's has been completely ruined, that's a slight exaggeration, but has certainly been challenged by the awareness that I was coming back this morning all perk and fresh and ready to take on the world, having to address Mark chapter 3, verse 29. Because that's where we've arrived in our journey in the Gospel of Mark to date. And I'd happily just skip over it, but I just know if I do, someone will catch me and say, wait a minute, what happened to Mark chapter 3, verse 29? It's my favorite verse. I wanted to hear what you were going to say about it. For those of you who may not remember, Mark chapter 3, verse 29, in the New International Version translation, which makes it as difficult as it could possibly be, Jesus is reported to have said, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Don't you love that? Has anybody made that their life verse? To carry through life with them, to encourage them and open their heart and uplift them and make them feel happy and good. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Never, never, ever be forgiven. I, asked, I added the ever, but it's a long time. That's a lot of not being forgiven. So it seems to me that you might want to go somewhere that someone, the preacher I suppose, could explain to you exactly what is this sin for which you are never going to be forgiven. Because you might want to avoid it. You might want to try really hard not to commit the sin that will never be forgiven. Now I know, I'm sure you all remember the last time I preached on this, which was probably seven years ago, <laughs> I'm sure you all remember that I came up with a really cool answer to that question. What is the sin that can never be forgiven? And at the time, I thought I was pretty smart. What's the sin that can never be forgiven? Well, I answered the question. The sin that can never be forgiven is the sin for which we don't ask forgiveness. Isn't that cool? So as long as you ask forgiveness, you're in like Flynn. No problem. No sin that will not be forgiven in your life because you always ask for forgiveness. Well, I think it was too smart, and I think it was wrong. And I have a different answer now, in my old age, and maybe, maybe it's too challenging for you, maybe it'll upset you, maybe you won't like it, but heck, I'm gonna be gone soon anyway, so just get used to it. What is the sin that can never be forgiven? Well, there isn't one. There is no sin that can never be forgiven. Remember back, uh, oh, 21st of November, we got to Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. And we read the story of the paralyzed man whose friends couldn't get him in to see Jesus because of the big crowd, so they took him up on the roof and they made a hole in the roof and they lowered him down into the presence of Jesus. And Jesus looked down at this paralyzed man as he lay there before him, and Jesus said, so, are you really sorry for all the bad things you've done? Are you really determined to be a better person? 
Are you really determined to smarten up so that you don't have to still be paralyzed? Right? No. That's some people's version of the story, but that's not the one that Mark, uh, that Mark tells in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. In Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, the paralyzed man is lowered down into the presence of Jesus. And the paralyzed man doesn't speak a word. Not one word in the whole story. And when Jesus saw their faith, the faith of those who brought this man to him, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. No evidence of repentance. No great little speech from the paralyzed man. Please, God, forgive me for all the terrible things I've done. Jesus simply declares your sins are forgiven. And think about, think about the prodigal son. Remember him? Luke chapter 15. The prodigal son was a real screw-up. He takes his father's inheritance, everything that is eventually going to come to him, and he goes off into a foreign land, to a strange place, and he squanders his entire inheritance. He has nothing to eat. He's hungry. He can't provide shelter for himself. And so, in Luke's account, this young man, Luke says, came to himself. And he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. Sounds like repentance, eh? Not really. It's self-serving, self-interest. He's hungry, he doesn't have enough food to eat, he knows where he can get food. So he gets up and he heads off to his father. And while he was still far off, his father saw him and, and what? And ran down the road saying, you've been bad. You should have been better. Are you sorry that you took all my money and went off into a far country and wasted it? Are you going to work harder at being a better person? Are you going to pull your life together? Are you going to be a better example of my love? That's not how the story goes. While he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then he threw a party. How irresponsible is that? What evidence is there that this young man's going to shape up at all? None that I can see. Or Luke chapter 7. There's a woman in the city who was, Luke says, a sinner. Jesus is at dinner in the house of the Pharisee Simon. And this woman is there and she weeps and she anoints his feet and wipes his feet with her hair. Now you may say, that's a sign of repentance, and you might be right, or you might be wrong. It might be a sign that she's just really, really sad. Or it might be a sign that she's seen something in Jesus that she wants to acknowledge and revere and honor. We don't know. We don't know because this woman doesn't speak. She doesn't say a word. And so Jesus has this little dialogue with Simon the Pharisee, and then he turns to the woman, and what does he say? He says, woman, your sins are forgiven. That's all. She doesn't ask. She doesn't seek forgiveness. He simply gives it. Or one last example. At the end of Luke's Gospel, Jesus is on the cross and he looks down at people who surely, to goodness, did not deserve for one moment to be forgiven. 
Roman soldiers, who are mocking him, ridiculing him, nailing him to the cross, inflicting unbearable torment on his body. And what does Jesus say to them? What does Jesus pray to God? God, help them to be better. God, make them see the errors of their ways. Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. God's forgiveness goes ahead of your even knowing that you need to be forgiven. It's there. You don't need to create it. You don't need to certainly earn it. You can't anyway. You don't need to deserve it. You don't need to be worthy of it. It's simply a fact. It's a given that God is in the business of extending to every one of us the grace of forgiveness, of embrace, of love, of acceptance, of welcome. There's no means test. There's no hurdle to jump over. It's simply there. The only question for any of us is whether or not we see it. And as soon as we see it, we go, oh, I'm so sorry for whatever. You see, the grace comes first. The repentance comes second. And the forgiveness is always there. So what about whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven? They are guilty of an eternal sin. What do we do with that verse? Well, I'm glad you asked. And now Kathy's going to come up and give you the answer. <laughs> like, seriously, it's a dreadful verse. But... Perhaps it won't surprise you to know that, in my humble opinion, it's not a very good translation. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. The verb to be isn't there. It's just a noun. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. It's odd. But what's even odder is that the word never is not there either. <laughs> There's no never in this verse. There's eternal and eternity, but not never. A literal, a literal kind of translation of this verse would say, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit has not, in eternity, forgiveness. Has not forgiveness. In eternity, you know, we get, we get really hung up on this word eternity, and it may mean a long, 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 long time, but it doesn't only mean that. It also means a quality of life here and now, okay? Eternity is something you are intended to live Today, here, now, in this life. It means really deep life. Deep, deep life. From that place within yourself that knows truth. And that's there in all of us. So really, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit is not living in deep Forgiveness. That's what we're called to. We're not called to be better people. We're not called to work harder or try harder. We're called to live in an awareness of that deep, profound, abiding forgiveness that God has extended to us. The problem is we don't recognize that grace. We don't recognize that spirit. And so we blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? It sounds so dreadful. Well, if you look at the context of this verse, 
As usual, Jesus is in conflict with the religious leaders of his day. And they are saying that his work is the work of the devil, the work of the dark side, the work of evil. They are looking at light and truth and goodness and beauty, and they are dismissing it as something wicked and evil. They are, in fact, speaking disrespectfully of Jesus' work and of God. That is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And, you know, it may sound heinous, it may sound so bad and so dreadful, but actually, and I'm really going out on the limb here, but it's exactly the same thing in this passage that Jesus' family do. Are you okay with that? Jesus' family in this passage blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. When his family heard of Jesus being in his home and nobody being able to get near him because of the great crowds and he couldn't even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, to get in his way, to stop him. For people were saying he has gone out of his mind. His family are attempting to erect a barrier to God's work in the world. They are looking at what Jesus is doing and they are falling prey to the error that suggests that his work is not the work of God. They are disrespecting the person of Jesus. Now there's a difference between Jesus' family and the scribes and the Pharisees. The difference is Jesus' family will come to recognize that they were wrong. And they will wake up to the power of God and the light and the truth that work in Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees, for the most part, won't. So that's the question for us. Are we able, are we willing, are we open to waking up? To waking up to the truth that the grace and the beauty and the light and the goodness of God suffuses all of life everywhere, all the time. And are we willing to open our hearts to that? This is Epiphany. And the point of Epiphany is the manifestation of God's glory. Not just here, not just in the Anglican Church, not just in the beauty of creation, everywhere. Everywhere, all the time. In spite of the darkness, in spite of this wretched weather we've been traveling through, although my grandchildren love it, in spite of COVID, in spite of disrupted Christmas celebrations, in spite of New Year's parties that couldn't happen, didn't happen, and shouldn't have happened, in spite of all of that, the light of God's presence is abundant and clear and present in every situation. The only question is if my eyes are open to see that which is there. And if my eyes are open to see, then my heart will open to forgiveness. And I will become a person who is able to extend forgiveness to others because I know at the core and the heart of my being, I am one who has been forgiven regardless of how wretched I am, regardless of how stupid I am, regardless of all the ignorant things I have done in my past or today or yesterday or that I will do tomorrow. God's forgiveness is always there, always calling, always reaching out, always inviting me to come and bow before the throne of grace and receive into my life again and again and again the power of God's Spirit that is seen in the light and the person 
of Jesus. Amen. whose love reaches to the highest heavens, whose righteousness stands like the tallest mountain, how can we keep silent? God, whose justice is deeper than any ocean and whose grace flows like a never-ending river, how can we keep silent? How can we not proclaim your majesty from generation to generation? How can we not raise the lamp of your salvation for all the world to see? God, who sent his son Jesus to live among us, whose love reaches to the highest heavens, we praise your name. On this Epiphany Sunday, may the light of Jesus shine in us and through us, that we may become beacons of truth and compassion. We lift our prayers to you this day, saying, Lord, in your mercy, and responding, hear Amen. our prayer. We hold in tenderness and release into love the collective suffering of our world at this time. So many have been deeply shaken by the pandemic. The numbers are incomprehensible, with 283 million infected globally and 5.5 million having died. The protocols in place to keep us safe are challenging and pressing even to the most resilient. Lord, may your light rise in this darkness. Comfort those who are suffering and give patience and endurance to all who are caring for the sick and suffering. We pray for the isolated, vulnerable, or gravely ill, that you will transform fear into hope. May they know your comfort and peace. We ask your blessing on Dr. Bonnie Henry and on all of the immunization support staff. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for the earth. God, forgive us, as we have not been faithful stewards of all you have given us on this rich earth. Help us to change. You've called us to live with respect and care for your creation. Bless us and teach us to be filled with awe as we recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature, with every living thing, on this journey towards your infinite life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are in harm's way this day. We remember to you today the many people around the world caught up in violent disputes between China and Taiwan, in Ethiopia, in Somalia and Kenya, between North and South Korea, in Afghanistan, Syria, and Yemen. We pray for those grieving the loss of loved ones who died in the recent gold mine collapse in Sudan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, for the whole people of God. Almighty God, whose people are knit together in one holy church, the body of your Son, make your home in us, be born anew in us. You alone are the light, the truth, and the way of all reconciliation. As we acknowledge our part in the genocide perpetrated on the first peoples of this land, help us on this journey to healing and reconciliation with indigenous peoples. Fill us with the grace to hold in our hearts those who continue to suffer from the colonialism and abuse that is a tragic part of our history. We pray for Bishop Anna Greenwood Lee and the diocesan staff. In our cycle of prayer for the parishes, we pray for St. Christopher and St. Aidan Lake Cowichan and their clergy, Eric Stephenson. In our own parish, we pray for Christopher and Heather and for the search committee as they begin the task of identifying a new rector for our community. We pray for the members of our 1115 congregation who are experiencing a shift in their worship routine. 
we pray for preparations for our annual meeting on, on February 1st. Lord, in your mercy, hear our yeah. prayer. We pray for this city, our local community. Give courage and hope to all who are grappling with the issues of mental health, drug addiction, substance abuse, and homelessness on our streets. We lift up to you the police officers, emergency personnel, provincial government liaisons, shelter and healthcare staff, working to provide support to this population in our city. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy and living God, you are our physician and our healer. Hear our prayers for those in need. May they find strength and peace in the love that holds them now. We lift up specifically Judith Kovats, Irania Izaza, Beth, Barb, Liz Vickers, and any others in the quietness of our own hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We give thanks to you, Lord, that we can entrust these concerns to you. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we may know the hope and love to which you call us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness, saying together, most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that, that we, we have, have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sin. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Having acknowledged the divided nature of the human experience, we affirm together that the peace of the Lord is always with us.
your hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God. Therefore, with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
Jesus invites you to this table. Come, you who are hungry, and you who know you are poor. Open your hearts. It is the Lord who invites you. Thank mm-hmm. you.
Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the world and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Please be seated for just a moment. Thank you for being here this morning. Bless you. Um, such a great way to begin your new year. I hope that you all managed to uh, juggle all the bits and pieces and complexities of Christmas celebrations. I don't imagine there's anybody for whom it went in a perfectly straight direction as planned. Uh, to borrow a phrase yet again from the immortal Larry Anthony, we all have to learn to pivot quickly these days. And so bless you for pivoting quickly and being here, you know, we gotta do what we can do to keep some semblance of life going around here. And uh, I think gathering in this little way is one of those things. It's just a sign that we're not gone. We haven't all just crawled into our little holes and pulled the earth in on top of us to hide for the rest of COVID, however long that's gonna be. We're still being very careful and very cautious, wearing our masks and keeping our distance, but doing what we can to say, Life goes on, and we face this with courage and boldness and with a sense of being able to celebrate the gifts there are in life. So bless you all for participating in that and bringing your spirits to help us have that joyful celebration among us. Um, I don't think there's anything else I need to tell anybody. Anybody got a birthday? Any Christmas? New Year's babies. It's my brother-in-law's birthday today. My sister was at the earlier service, and I forgot. Oh. I'm a bad brother-in-law. You're forgiven. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Spoken like a true priest. Okay, are you looking for a song there? No, I'm looking for a battery of the first time. Your guitar has died. Yeah. Oh. Might be quicker to look for it. Could you hear the guitar in the last song? Yes. Yes, really? Yes. No? Yes. Kind of it just will continue. It's going to be, it's going to be. What are we uh, singing? In, in the town here, I think. Oh, well, we know this one. Yeah, I think so. Please stand. Oh, there's something up there. Oh, that's. It's just fading a little bit. Loads of them. <laughs> Thank you. 